In this video, I'll be briefly explaining the concept of stated preference, which is one of the two main classes of what we refer to as non-market valuation techniques. Non-market valuation is a very interesting concept in economics because it's something that those of us who prior to coming to economics and for those folks outside of economics, they've never heard. Um, and in fact, one of the interesting things about non-market valuation techniques is they really attempt to cut across the main argument against trying to quantify environmental benefits. Oftentimes people will argue that one of the problems or issues with quantifying environmental benefits is that it's very hard to know how much, say for example, a tree is worth without say cutting it down and turning it into a book or whatever. We, we in a sense can find out quickly how much a tree is worth if it's cut down and then sold on a market. However, if we don't cut a tree down, as many of us believe is often a better choice than cutting it down, then it's very hard for us to understand how much we actually benefit from that particular tree. Therefore, it becomes difficult for us to know how much we should spend in attempting to preserve that particular tree. And instead of uh, hiding behind sort of calls for our better angels in the sense of instead of calling for people to just quote unquote care about trees or environmental issues, what non-market valuation attempts to do is sort of point out that we already been, uh, quantify, quantify these products for ourselves um, and that we in fact can think about these things in the context of markets. We have discussed previously the concept of cost-benefit analysis in which we want to weigh the benefits of a particular policy uh, with the cost of administering that particular policy. Now, for environmental protection, oftentimes the cost of environmental policy are relatively well known, whether it's a particular administrative mandate with a particular standard, or whether it's a new technology mandate, or whether it's just administrative regulatory framework in terms of we know it's going to require a certain number of individuals to say inspect pipelines and to make sure they're safe um, or to inspect deep water drilling uh, rigs out in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico to make sure that they're safe. So we have a sense of how much it costs to say prevent environmental problems or clean up environmental problems, but we oftentimes don't have a good understanding of the actual quantifiable benefits from these particular policies. Um, again, we oftentimes revert to relying upon calls for ethical considerations about the environment and sort of calls of, you know, sort of more environmentalist themed um, reasons for protecting the environment in that it's something that we should do. But if we can come at this problem from more of well, let's see and think about this from an economic perspective, and let's try to come up with a value for environmental amenities. And in fact, I think that's often the way that economists tend to think about environmental um, components, rivers and forests and beaches and wetlands and, and things like this are, to the economist, considered amenities. Now, this brings in some interesting ethical and maybe moral questions about do we want to quantify the value of the environment? Is this, is this a road that we want to go down? And I think that economists, despite our own personal opinions on the environment, we see that, well, if we don't quantify these things, if we don't have conversations about how much we should be spending on protecting the environment, then almost implicitly society assigns a value of zero to these things. Um, so if we don't, say, put a price on that tree when we don't cut it down and say the tree is worth or, you know, by not cutting the tree down, we're giving up a certain amount of potential profit, then we don't sort of have a particular idea of the kind of full nature of these issues. And so the economist, I think, by thinking about things in an economic perspective, says, well, OK, there aren't, say, a market for not cutting down a tree but let's sort of try to construct it. And then, and then if we're able to do that, we know therefore how much society shape, suppose should spend on reducing deforestation and you know how much uh, forest we feel that we should actually maintain. Because as it is now, you know, the idea of say, maintaining environmental amenities as much as possible, even that doesn't give us much of a regulatory framework or provide us any sort of road map as to how much and uh, or how little we want to say improve the environmental amenities.
Okay, so before we get started in the context of uh, stated preference techniques, let's first go back a little bit and define something we had actually previously talked about in the class, and that was this idea of implicit value. See, the problem with environmental amenities is that they have this market value, but then they also have this non-market value, or what you might refer to as implicit value. Now, the reason why this is important is because if we only consider the market value of an environmental amenity from a social perspective, we are highly discounting how much that particular environmental amenity is actually worth um, to society at large by not considering the fact that it has this non-market value. And here's what I mean by non-market value. In the context of market value, we have both consumptive as well as non-consumptive values for things. What we mean by sort of consumptive value is take a forest, as I was previously mentioning, and imagine that there are several different ways in which we can consume that forest. There's the consumptive value of cutting the forest down and using it for timber, building homes, making writing books, whatever it is. There's also the consumptive value of visiting the forest and using its amenities for camping uh, or for tree climbing or for um, flora and fauna research, you know, whatever it is, right? We can use the forest uh, without cutting it down. This would also sort of have a certain consumptive value to it, right? We travel to the forest and we enjoy it. There's also the non-consumptive value um, of, of the forest in that there is value to its existence. Um, there's value to our option of using the forest at some point in the future. We also, in the current time period, value the fact that we may leave the forest for those that come after us. We may bequest the forest to our progeny, our children, grandchildren, and great-great-grandchildren. And so, in this sense, the forest itself takes on multiple values. You have the value of the forest itself in the context of what we use it for, whether we're cutting it down or whether we're hiking it or whether we're leaving it alone. Um, and then there's also the value of the fact that it, it is valuable because it exists. And again, it's, it, it's valuable because it exists because we can consume it in the future or it's valuable because it exists because we're not going to consume it in the future. And so this sort of gets at sort of philosophical way in which humans view environmental amenities and often is the catalyst for so much of the political disagreement about this because it really does require us to consider that there is this almost ethereal value um, almost abstract value to environmental amenities that are not going to be captured by any sort of economic market and if economists are going to consider things like utility, you know, that consumers react to different changes in prices and different changes in incomes and, you know, movements in the broader macro economy, that they're making these decisions based on utility maximization, that is, that consumers are doing what's best for themselves, then that, in a, in a sense, goes a long way in explaining why there are so many diverging opinions as to what we should do with both individual environmental amenities like forest, but also what we should do about the broader environmental portfolio of, say, a country or, or even the world. Um, so let's talk a little bit about stated preference. If the goal of non-market valuation is to, in fact, try to create markets, then what we're essentially trying to do is create the demand curve for an environmental amenity. So in this particular graph, we have miles of river cleaned. So you can imagine that there is a river that's dirty. It's been polluted by some economic process. Uh, perhaps a steel manufacturer has dumped mercury into it. And society benefits from clean rivers. Society benefits from clean rivers for multiple reasons. They benefit from clean rivers because we get to enjoy them, and swim in them, fish out of them. We also get to enjoy the economic benefits of clean rivers, both in the context of they allow us to have, you know, fishing tours and, you know, sort of other, other sort of tours down the river. Um, they also allow for other private enterprises like the irrigation of farmland. And so maintaining clean water has both sort of abstract environmental benefit, what we would call non-use value, um, but it also has economic benefit. 
but the economic benefit, as we previously mentioned, is going to be much smaller than the total benefit that we believe the product or excuse me, the amenity has when we consider both its use, its consumptive value, as well as its non-consumptive value. So the goal is really to get an accurate idea of the demand for environmental amenity, considering both its consumptive and non-consumptive value, which is not an easy task to do. Essentially, what we want to do is we want to create the maximum willingness to pay for cleaning up miles of river. And so in a sense, what we're trying to understand is how much does society value a clean river mile? And depending upon how much society benefits and values a clean river mile, this goes a long way in telling us how much we should spend on cleaning up the river and, in fact, how many miles of the river we should clean up. Now, stated preference is a method that usually involves surveying. So what we do is we ask individuals a series of questions, and the goal is to elicit willingness to pay or willingness to accept propositions for environmental amenities. So for example, we may ask a question, given the three options below, which would you most prefer? A, 10 miles of river is cleaned up and everyone is charged $10. B, 15 miles of river is cleaned up and everyone is charged $15 or C, 20 miles of river is cleaned up and everyone is charged $20. What you'll notice is that this question gets at a couple different issues. One, it asked, first off, how much of the river should be cleaned up. Second, it asked how much people should be charged for it. And then additionally speaking, and this is where economic theory comes into play, you'll notice that this particular question adheres to the law of demand which says that as the price of a product rises, the quantity demand for that product should fall. So in this particular scenario, we can see that the idea would be that if we're going to clean up more of the river, we would need to charge more money in order to be able to do that. Therefore, by asking people how much they would be willing to clean up relative to an increasing price, we are mimicking the fact that A, it's going to be more costly to clean up more miles of the river, and B, as it becomes more costly to clean up miles of the river, we expect people to report that they are less willing to clean up the river. And again, this is mimicking the idea of creating a demand curve for this particular environmental amenity. Another type of question we might ask is something like this. Which of the following scenarios do you most prefer, assuming a fee of $10 is paid by everyone for environmental cleanup? In this sense, we're showing and talking about what people would be willing to pay given a particular fee. Or you might even think about this as a tax. Say, suppose that your taxes were increased by $10. Which of the most scenarios would you prefer? 10 miles of river cleaned, 15 miles of river cleaned, or 20 miles of river cleaned? Again, we're getting at both the amount of river that society wants to see clean and also how much society is willing to pay in order to clean up that particular river. As we mentioned before, we can also come at this from a willingness to accept framework. For example, what is the most you'd be willing to pay for 15 miles of river cleanup? This tells us, in a sense, what you're willing to pay in order to clean up the river, but it also allows us to understand how much of the river you're willing to leave as dirty. In other words, what you're willing to accept in terms of a dirty river. The problem, of course, with stated preference models and what we refer to as contingent valuation is that it is surrounded by a lot of particular bias. So if I'm asking people a series of questions, like I am showing you here previously, and I'm trying to elicit values so that I may construct a demand curve for environmental amenities, then I'm worried about several forms of bias. The first is called hypothetical bias. Notice that these questions we're asking are hypothetical in nature. They don't necessarily refer to an actual environmental policy. And even if they do refer to an actual environmental policy, it may be hard for me to convince an individual that they will actually have to pay these particular charges. These questions, of course, are not agreements to pay a particular charge, and so they're hypothetical. And I'm worried as an economist that if I'm asking someone a hypothetical question, then their response to that is not necessarily driven by the underlying economics, but instead it's being driven by perhaps their unwillingness to pay the fee. Or on the other end of the spectrum, their bias could work in the opposite direction. If you're an environmentalist and I give you a series of questions, you may in fact lie to me and say that you would prefer there to be more river cleaned up and you're willing to pay more for it than you actually might be. In fact, this has been one of the more interesting 
existing lines of research. So what they'll do is they'll ask someone, what are you willing to pay to say clean up an environmental amenity? The person reports a particular willingness to pay. Later on, at some point in the future, they then offer this individual the ability to pay for a particular level of environmental amenity and perhaps not surprisingly, the individual actually lowers what they're willing to pay it only pays a, a value less than what they originally said they were willing to pay um, so this is a problem in this particular type of research now if you can carefully construct your questions um, and i'm going to give you a reading um, to read about these particular issues then you can try to reduce hypothetical bias by structuring your questions in a certain way but it's fairly hard uh, to do that it's a it's a particular issue the second type of bias would be information bias. The fact is, is that individuals have varying degrees of information about both the extent of damage caused by environmental problems and also the extent of what environmental problems actually do. And so there's also this informational bias where some people that you survey are going to have a lot more information than other people in your survey. But of course, you would prefer if everyone in your survey had all the same information. This is why surveys are often accompanied with fairly robust explainers as to both the underlying environmental issue that's being considered and the point of the study and also allows the survey taker to either have their understanding of the environmental problem made better made more enlightened or to actually enlighten the individual completely this may be an environmental problem they didn't even know exists and so when surveys are, are sent out to individuals for contingent valuation surveys it often and almost always includes a lot of information about the particular uh, issue at hand. Another form of bias is so-called starting point bias. And what this means is that when we think about environmental problems, there's a certain static nature to this. In other words, we're sort of freezing time and we're talking about environmental problems right now in this moment. Well, we all have different perceptions of what that means to us. So for example, some of us may feel that there's not enough environmental uh, policy that we're not regulating the environmental damage enough where other people feel different well what this means is that depending upon what types of questions I ask in my survey I'm gonna have individuals coming from different starting points some people may feel that the environmental amenity is already too protected therefore their answers are biased by that fact that they believe that or I may be someone who doesn't believe the environmental amenities being uh, cleaned up enough or being you know made better enough and therefore that's going to put me also at a different starting point bias this is oftentimes very much related to information bias um, fourth is strategic bias it may be the case that if someone believes that the answers that they give on a particular survey are then actually going to be what they have to pay so if on a particular survey I ask someone how much they're willing to pay to clean up a river and if this person worries that in the future their say taxes go up as a result of their answer this may in fact elicit people to again provide lower willingness to pay than they actually value the particular environmental amenity which is of course very problematic the goal of contingent valuation surveys in the context of stated preference is we want to get people to state a particular preference and we want to believe that this preference is their true value so you know sort of the true value they have to the, this particular environmental amenity um, strategic bias uh, as well as the other form of biases that we've been discussing what they do is they cause willingness to pay to be not equal to willingness to accept what I mean by this is that let's say that I offer you the following two options you can pay fifteen dollars to clean up one mile of river or I could pay you fifteen dollars to leave that one mile of river dirty economic theory tells us that your answer to that question should be the same if you would be willing to pay fifteen dollars to clean up a mile of river then you should be willing to accept fifteen dollars in order to leave that mile dirty but research after research tells, show, uh, tells us that in fact oftentimes people's willingness to pay for something is different than their willingness to accept the opposite of that thing uh, and then of course this causes problems as well in our belief that the answers to contingent valuation surveys are true values.